James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. You in the trials of life, the trials of life. Now, trials are real, aren't they? Aren't they? Trials are real. And all of us face them. All of us go through them. We go through them. At home, at work, at church, at school, they're, they're, they're there. And here we see in the Scripture the Spirit of God inspiring James. And this James is not the Apostle James that was the brother of John, this James is the half-brother of Jesus, the first pastor of the Jerusalem church. Is everybody with me? And he says to the brethren, and this went out to all, around the Christian world, which wasn't very far at that time, but to churches, and it was passed and copied and passed and copied and passed and passed and copied down and, and retained. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now, how many people get up this in the morning and say, good morning, Lord. I can't wait to see what trial I got to go through today. We don't think that way, do we? Uh, because, you know, number one, our flesh doesn't like that. Our flesh doesn't like it. And, and, and depending, and you know, we all have um, baggage, you know, since none of us had perfect parents or perfect grandparents or none of us have been perfect parents, we have uh, things we accumulate. Every teacher I ever had, was not, not one of them was perfect. You know, every coach in, in every athletic uh, team I was ever every I didn't have a perfect coach. I've never had a perfect employer in the sense of uh, other than God, you know. But, I mean, I'm talking about, um, well, perfection, sinless perfection. I've never experienced it by being sinless and perfect or around anyone who is. Is everybody on the same page here? So, because of that, trials trials. Every, every failure, every failure that you experience, whether you're on the giving in or the receiving in, is a love failure. How can I say that? Because the Bible says love never fails. That just hit me this week. Love Never fails. Now, I can look at my wife and I love her dearly. I mean, I just, I love her. But I'm not, I have failed her. You understand? Wasn't perfect. I, I've, I've oh, dropped the ball or saucer or plate or. Here, pick this up. Oh, it's hot. Well, you big dummy, you're supposed to get these gloves on. And I mean, I, I mean, you understand? So how are we to look at trials? How, how, how can I count it all joy? How can I? The Lord tells us right here in his word. You see, the path of life's not an easy, it's not an easy uh, path to walk, is it? You know? And the fact that you've embraced Jesus Christ, well, that's got old Slewfoot's attention. And, and, 
you know, un until you really embrace Jesus, he never noticed you. I mean, your flesh and the world system was enough to keep you in the wrong place, doing the wrong things, thinking the wrong way. But now that we've accepted Jesus and we've been delivered, you know, I better give him some thought. I better give her some thought. And so, you know, life, there's, there's all kinds of trials, sorrow, heartbreak. You know, I saw it in, in our dear friend's eyes back here at, at, at dinner, you know. I mean, it, talk a little bit and then cry a little bit, you know. Heart, heartbroken, yet they knew it was the right thing, the right thing to do. But life, life has sorrow, you know. Uh, Don and Gary, Donna's sister's husband passed away, 83 years old, hardened, hardened person, got cancer in two weeks, or I don't know, two weeks, four weeks, uh, sometime he, he accepted Christ, you know? And even if he was not, even if he was a Marine sergeant all his life, it still hurts, Right? So, so here we have these things, you know, and sickness and disease and accidents and death and temptation, all these things, and, and how, how, do, how do we face these things like he tells it? Count it all joy. Oh, boy. Yeehaw. How do we do this? We, first of all, I've got to believe, just like it says here, if I believe God, if I believe He's my Lord and He's my Sovereign, He's my King, He's my Savior, He's my all in all, then I need to allow Him to work in my life, and believe it or not, He uses trials. He'll use anything and everything. I was speaking into the life of a fella... Uh, this week, and, and, and you know, uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but I just said, you've got to understand, this is a test, and you need to pass it so you can get promoted. Because it's just like, remember back in school, if you didn't pass, you I mean, I can remember when they held people back. I don't think they do that much anymore. <laughs> but I remember you had to pass to advance, right? Well, God hadn't changed his Graden ways. And so God uses trials. And you've got to believe, even though it hurts or it angers you, you know, don't, don't, don't respond in anger. As a, as a dear sister said, uh, encouraged as we were talking, respond in love. Respond in love. Because love never fails. Amen. Love never never fails. And so, God will use trials for, for its good, and, and there's benefits in it. There's a beneficial purpose in trials. There is. And you and I might not see it right at first, but eventually we will, and we'll understand it. You know, it's our, it's our human nature to want to everything just go smooth and glide along and, and everybody's just, you know, cheesecake and watermelon. You know, it's just uh, fried chicken and, you know, and mashed potatoes. It's just, oh, everything's smooth and yummy. But that's not the way life is, is it? Mm-mm. No. Nope. No. Nope. They might call them string beans, but somebody left a string in there. You see, God can take the experiences you go through, and he, and, he, and he does, and He'll make us stronger people. He will make us stronger people. My grandma used to say, Eve, she said, steel has to have a little temper to stand. You see, steel it has temper under control. Isn't that good? And so we are being tempered 
with trials. And we can believe that God has a plan and God has a purpose and it's good. Now, will you trust God? Will you believe God? You know, you, uh, I heard it said years ago, I mean, long time ago. It was like back in, hmm, my goodness, maybe oh, oh, 77 or 78. I heard a great preacher say, his name was John R. Rice. And he said, you're either in a trial, just come out of a trial, getting ready to go in a trial. And if you don't know who John R. Rice is, that's your, your loss. Google him. Great man of God. Uh, great, great defender of the faith. He went to heaven in 1981, or 1980, I believe it was. You see, when you walk triumphantly, now that's important. When we walk triumphantly through the problems and trials of life, we become stronger. And God wants us stronger. Because He knows what next week, next month, next year holds, and we, and we don't. But He wants to strengthen us and to prepare us for what lies out yonder. You see, we'll become more focused more determined, we'll become more steadfast, more confident, not arrogant, but confident. Confidence is not a bad thing if it's in Jesus. And He wants that to be. He wants that in us. And then, you see, you can be trusted to persevere and to fulfill your assignment because we all have assignments. We all have duties and responsibilities. Amen? You know, you know, somehow along the line, we believe what the world says. Your life's yours. Mm -mm. It either belongs to the devil or it belongs to Jesus. It's not yours. Because you can't keep it very long. You know? I mean, it's a 100% chance you're not going to get out of this life alive. <laughs> and then what? You see, uh, of course, now, if the Lord comes in the rapture, that's different. But, but you understand what I'm saying? And so, who, who is your life focused around, centered around, trusting and relying on? And if you're relying on yourself, you're, you're, back, in, you're back in a losing horse in that race. So, your strength also... As you go through a trial and you're strengthened, you're matured, you're, you're, you, you become more focused, you become more of a, a man or woman of the Word, a man or woman of prayer, a, a man or woman of, of, the, of the body, of the church, then that will enable you to help others. And we are to help others. Aren't we? You know, and, and every week... You know, I, I'm, I'm kind of in, I, 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 I'm too introspective. You know, I, I look in probably too much. And, I, and I, I look at myself and I, and, I, and I take inventory and I think, how many people have I touched this week for Jesus? That's a good question to ask. How many people have you on purpose touched for Jesus? I'm not saying you want them to Jesus or not. It'd be great if you want them all, but I mean, I mean, but touched them in some way and pointed them to Jesus. Spoke to them with purpose. Spoke into their lives. Showed them love and consideration and 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 just showed them Jesus. How many? You know? How many? How many? Mm. Every, uh, I forget what that is, every, every six or every, hmm, 
every minute or every, I forget how many people go into eternity every minute I used to know. It's increasing because there's more of people in there. Do you realize in, 20, in, in 15 years, China will be the largest Christian nation on earth? Now, you think that one through. I, I want America. I mean, I know there's almost 2 billion Chinese, you know, and, and we're, we're just like 330 million. I know we're not going to, you know, the way our birth rates have gone from 10 a household to 1.3, we're not going to catch them. But I'd like to have our percentage higher, wouldn't you? Well, then we need to face our trials and walk through them knowing that God's got a plan and a purpose. It's not, and, 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 and the devil, here's how the devil will try to get you distracted at, uh, about the trial. Oh, what did I do wrong? Why is God mad at me? Why isn't he treating me better? And we'll start thinking the wrong way, doing the... Listen, God has good in mind for you. He has good in mind for you. So, I believe God. I believe God has a... And I need to allow Him to work in my life, in the trial, in the thing, whatever it is. Whatever it is, you know... Um, my goodness, I think today I've got six calls from people who have been foreclosed on and they're on the street. Today was a banner day in receiving calls where people have, been, have, have gone bankrupt and lost their home. And they're on the street trying to scrape up enough money for a week in some motel that only if you were desperate would you stay there. And I'm thinking, man, I, I wish I had eight or nine hundred dollars. You know, when you total it all up, or or a thousand, or whatever it was. But we, God help us. Now those folk are going through trials, and of course you know me. Oh, I'm sorry. I listen and I empathize and I, I pray with them. But before I do all that, I ask them, I say, well, where do you go to church? <laughs> None of them go to church. Not a one of them. It's amazing. They, they're all looking for a church. And they've all been looking now for three or four years. Or five. Or seven. It's amazing that you can be somewhere. You know, don't misunderstand me. They are suffering. They, they're, you know, I'd hate to think I'm going to be sleeping in the back of a Toyota tonight. Wouldn't you? And yet, they're in a trial. And they're desperate. But if they'd look to the one who loves them the most, they could find purpose. And they'd probably find the open door and the blessing. Do you understand? You see, when you rise, when you when you face the trial, knowing that God is God, and God's got some, God good intentions and a good purpose and a for you in the trial, then, dear friend, you can rise above the trial. You can. You can rise above it. And, and you can see that. And, and because of that, you know what happens? You become a, I don't even know if it's a word, purer or more pure. I don't know which is correct. Grammar was never my strong suit. More pure or purer. You become a more pure person. Do you hear me? When you can rise above it and realize that, and, and I know it's hard. Trust me, I know it's hard. This is not an attack against you. 
this is an opportunity for God to strengthen you and to elevate you, bring you to a higher level in Christ. And, and all the time, when the devil, what he intends for evil, and, and sometimes we do stupid things that open the door to let the devil rush in. But even those yucky stuff, those yucky things, if we'll give it to him, he can take it and turn it for good and, and, and help us to come up to a higher level. Oh. Well, you know, this joy thing is uh, really a possibility when you look at it correctly. I know it's not, sometimes it's, oh, I'm telling you, I understand. You know, you, uh, when you feel like a pin cushion, <laughs> all the arrows and the fiery darts and, and the backstabbing and, and the, the undermining, you know, uh, I've heard it all. You know, we've all faced those things in time time in our life. And after a while, you get a little gun shot. But no, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Trust God and look to Him to know that regardless of what fan is fanning that flame, regardless of what it is, you can, he, you, you can rise above that. You can respond to it in a correct, a godly way, a, a biblical way. And he will lift you up. And you'll become a better person, a better follower of Jesus. Wow. That's helping me see trials a lot better. I need to look at them like God does. To know. That he is the sovereign Lord Almighty. And he is in control. You see, when you rise above problems and hardships, you know what will happen? People are going to expect you to respond like a fallen person in your flesh. But when you rise above and you respond in a way that glorifies and honors God and 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 you you're you're focused on you know I'm not going to fail I'm this is not going to be a love failure I'm not going to fail then God takes that testimony and makes you a more dynamic witness because the lost let me tell you lost people are watching they watch you and me all. I mean, they watch us. They watch us. I've even tried to slow down. And I know they're watching me. You know? You think I'm crazy. I'm telling you the truth. It's been a long time since I've gone 100 miles an hour. Or 90. Or 80. We become a more dynamic witness. So God wants us to face our trials and our hardships by drawing closer to Him and asking for His help. Lord, I don't know the answer. I don't know the why. I don't know the motivation. I don't know any of this stuff. I don't comprehend it. I just don't. Lord, I'm looking to you for help, understanding, and direction. Hey, I can get joy out of that. I know that trials are designed to drive me closer to Him. Be encouraged, dear friend. Be encouraged that He's got a better plan than you and me. Now, we are to face trials and suffering with a, the spirit of joy, but not really. And I know you might be saying, how is this possible now? Come on, preacher. How can you be joyful when you're facing adversity or something of severity, something horrendous? Joy is not usually what usually fills our hearts when we face these things. When a severe crisis comes our way, too often we despair and we lose hope. Oh my goodness, I don't know what I'm going to. Most of us certainly do not respond with joy naturally. There's only one way that to face trials and temptations. With the spirit of joy. And you know what we got to do? We got to change our way of thinking. 
We've got to choose to change the way we think and take on more the mind of Christ. We've got to, we've, instead of responding in, the, in our natural man, like we naturally will want to respond and respond in a way that the world responds, we have to change our thinking and turn your attitude about the situation completely around. Well, now, God, what do you have in mind? I'm looking for you, and if I'm looking for God in the thing, I'm looking for something good because God is good. She read it tonight in Psalm 100. God is good. The Lord, He is good. He's our creator. He, he, we're the sheep of His pasture. You see? So God's got something good in mind, even though initially you, you and I can't see it. You and I are might, we're hurt by it. We're stunned by it. We're blindsided by it. But yet, look for God in this thing. And when you look for God, you're looking for good. You're looking for His glory and His greatness and His purpose. And you, when you embrace God and all that, you know what comes? You can't help but be joyful. Because when you embrace God, I tell you the joy bells ring. Because He is good. Full of grace and mercy, forgiveness, restoration. Amen? And so... You need to know that the testing of your faith during trials, it, it develops, um, uh, it's an old word, uh, perseverance. It's a, it's a word we don't use very often today, but it's a good word. Perseverance. You just, listen, I'm going to keep on. I'm going to stay with the stuff. I'm not a quitter. I'm not a, a, a deserter. I am not a coward. I am not. How can I be a coward? You know, just because you, it might, oh, you know, you, you know what, you know what bravery is? It's fear under control. That's what courage is. Doing the right thing when your flesh says, oh, man, run and hide. But the right thing is to stand and march. And with him as our general, as our king, as the captain of, of our salvation, we can follow him anywhere. Amen. We can follow him anywhere. And so. Keep in mind when the. What point one stressed a while back? God allows trials in our life not to defeat or discourage, but to arouse us and to draw us closer to Him. And it makes us stronger. It makes us more Christ-like, more righteous. Uh, uh, if we're more Christ-like, his, it's His righteousness. Uh, righteous To be righteous is living right. And that's what it makes us. So, so trials... Aren't you know? Yeah, it's bad for our flesh. It, it, uh, it our flesh doesn't like trials, and our emotions. You see, our emotions, our soul, our intellect, our emotion, our will. You see, if you're feeding your soul with the things of God, then your emotions will be respond rightly. But if you're feeding off this, if you're spending more time, uh, you know, watching television or or, or reading something that doesn't draw you closer to Jesus. If you're spending more time in stuff that... Um, then your, your reaction, your emotion will be not godly. Is everybody with me? Everybody having fun? I don't hear... I don't hear okay. So... You... We need to let perseverance develop in us. Now, our flesh says run every time there's any kind of thing that doesn't suit us. Every time something don't go the way I want it, you know, I'm going to quit that job, or I'm going to leave that church, or I'm going to get out of that marriage, or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to run away from home.
And, and if that's all we do, we never learn what the lessons we're supposed to do, learn through the trial and draw closer to him and be promoted. We're, w- don't set yourself up to go around that same mountain again and again and again and again and again. Amen. Face the trial. Walk through. Persevere. Walk through with Jesus. Walk in love. And you'll learn some things you're never, ever going to learn any other way. Well, that's fun, isn't it? So what's the results? What are the results here? Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing the testing of your faith produces patience. And that, that, that has the idea of endurance or, or perseverance. And, and it says, let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect. And that word perfect has the idea of being mature. You know, a maturation process, a maturity. You know, my grandma said a, a, a male never become a man until he's about 30. Sometimes females got to female womanhood by the age of 25, but usually it took men about five years longer. And that's how, that was her opinion, you know, after all those years of being around men, <laughs> married to one, you know. And, uh, and, 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 you know, there's probably some truth there. I know gals kind of mature quicker in, in every aspect of life. So I, she probably knows she probably on to something. Don't be an 85-year-old spiritual teenager. Amen. Let God grow us up and mature us. Knowing that, that the adversities of life, the situations of life that may not be pleasant and, and, and may not be something you would choose for yourself, trust that God is there. And he's got something good designed for you through it. And even it, you can go through it and not see it. But sooner or later, you will. Because our God's that good. Amen? Well, (coughs) I become more mature. I become more uh, perfected. I become more complete. I... Uh, it eliminates pers- more personal weaknesses. You know? <clears throat> Some people are very overt and sanguine in their personality. Uh, you don't know anybody like that. Maybe. Maybe you do. Uh, and, and for people like me, I mean like sanguines, It's real easy just to be out there all the time. You understand? And some people don't appreciate that. I don't understand why. But that, that scares some people, and, it's, and some people kind of, you know, just don't click with that. And then there are the people on the, on the other extreme that are so phlegmatic, you know, they're so quiet and laid back that a bomb could go off and, and they might look, but they wouldn't even say, wow. You know? Well, both have strengths, but both have weaknesses. And God wants to hone off rough edges of the sanguine. And God wants to develop some edges that are missing from the phlegmatic. Do you understand? The, the choleric personality, you know, the, the Sergeant Carter. This, 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 very, you know. Kind of puts me in the mind of somebody that left this world, you know. I mean, you know what I mean? Very disciplined, very structured, everything in its place and a place for everything, you know. It, dirt, you go over here. I mean, you, you understand? Well, that kind of, you know, everybody needs some organization administration. Everybody needs some order. But if you're not tempered by the Spirit of God, your order becomes your God. 
Is everybody with me? And so God will let trials come into that life to loosen them up and soften them up and develop some areas that need developed and knock off some rough edges that need knocked off. Now, we need organization. We need administration. We need discipline. We need all those things. The sanguine needs it. The phlegmatic needs it. And then, then there's the melancholy. The melancholy person. They, you know, oh, bother. You know, they're Eeyores. You know, oh, bother. Well, look at that glass of water. It's half empty. Oh, bother. Where's the straw? Who's touched this glass? Oh, bother. I'm, you get the point? The thing of it is, melancholies um, can be very analytical, and they can see things that a lot of people can't see. But if it's not tempered by the Spirit of God, they become very negative and very just, you know, no, no, they don't bring joy to anybody. They're miserable themselves, and misery loves company. Do you understand? But God made us all. Now, the fall damaged us all, and that's why God, in His love, has designed trials, tests, so we can be strengthened where we're weak, and we can be accentuated where we are strong. And, and through it all, we'll learn to love Him more, love ourselves in a more healthier way. Because I find that most people have a problem really loving themselves in a healthy way. We really do. You know, we, we, like, to, we like to whoop ourselves. And I don't mean it in a kinky way, but you understand? We like to discipline our, I mean, we're really, oh, you dummy. We call ourselves names. We call ourselves stupid and dumb and ignorant and ugly and, and, and lazy and, you know, too skinny or too fat and all this other stuff. You know, don't we? And if we'll learn to love ourselves in a healthier way, a healthy way, can I tell you something? There's nothing you can do that will cause God to love you any more than what he does right now. And there's nothing you can do to cause him to love you any less. He loves you supremely. He loves you with his whole heart. And he's got wonderful things in store for you. If you'll come to a place of greater surrender... A place of greater yieldedness. And let's submit one to another and prefer one another above ourselves. And let's follow him and let's love him with all our hearts, our minds, our souls, our strength. And let's love each other as we're supposed to love ourselves. And when trials come, we'll face them with joy. Because we see them for what they really are. God's not mad at you. You know, the devil didn't catch God sleeping and sneak up on you. I can count it joy because God's got something good in store. Now, you've got to look at it that way. If you look at it through hate or anger or, or something evil, the devil will just poison your spirit. But if you'll look at it the way God looks at it, know what's in his heart. He's got something good in store for you. And I can say, wow, that does bring joy to me. Do I enjoy walking through landmines? <laughs> no, spiritually speaking, you know, spiritual landmines and IEDs or I, I, whatever they are. I'm going to get away from those three letters. I'll mess up. <laughs> I can look at it with joy. 
Anybody here named Joy? <laughs> Let patience have its perfect work. It's, it's completing work. It's maturing work. It's perfect what God has in store. God's perfect. And what he has in mind for you through the trial is for your good and his glory. It's not to hurt you, not to harm you. It's to help you. Can you do you hear me tonight? And so, and, and, and don't, don't rebel against it. Don't be afraid of it. Don't chafe against it. But know that my God loves me. And I can go with him through anything. And that ought to bring you joy. You are not alone. It's not you against the world. It's you and Jesus that makes us victors. Amen? And, and, you know, it makes no difference what the doctor said. You know, God, thank God for doctors, hospitals, and medicine, and all this stuff. Thank God for it. But I'm telling you, the doctor's not the final word. My God is. My God is. And so, dear friends, be encouraged. And look at, the, look at the, the last two words in verse 4. If you'll put it up there, please. Lacking nothing. Now let me ask you. Are you completely full of everything and lacking nothing? Uh, I've never met anybody like that, have you? But God has things in mind that will bring you to a place that you realize that you have everything you need. And the purpose of these trials is so that you will be without lack. And you'll understand what lack really is. It's not, uh, you know, well, I only got 10,000. I wish I had 20. You know. Or, or, you know, you fill in the numbers. I'm telling you, with God you don't lack. And he will give you everything necessary to go through the trial. And you'll be brought to a higher place. And you'll be a better person for it. A better Christian and stronger. And it just gives him more glory. And that's why we were created. To know him, to love him, and to glorify him. Amen. So, if you're in a trial, be joyful. If you come out of one, be joyful. If you're just going into one, be joyful. Count it all joy. Don't say, oh, no, what's the devil doing? No, just say, what is my God up to? It's good. It's good. You know, if you've ever played... Uh, Football, you know, organized football, high school or, you know, middle school or peewee or whatever, whatever they got. Little, they, they got all kinds of. You know, the first, the first uh, weeks of, like, say, high school football. First week, you, you never put pads on. You don't have a helmet. Oh, yeah, they give you a helmet. Man, you wish you had didn't have it. Put that helmet on, and it's, in, it's first August, and it's 95 degrees. And they give you a pair of shorts and a bit and a t-shirt, and and that's just almost all there is. And the first thing, five laps, five laps around football field is a mile. You know, these these star these these you know. It's not who gets down to the hundred that goal line first. Let them dummies if they want to sprint, they can sprint. This is not a sprint, this is a marathon. You know? And about halfway through you're passing these these I can't even think of a great sprinter now. Some gold medalist. Jesse Owens. I remember him. You know, and you're just 
loping along. Finally, you get through with those five laps. Man, you didn't realize you, you could sweat like that. And, oh, you'd like to have a bunch of water. And you say, okay, everybody get a cup of water. You can get a cup of water and back in, back in the 60s, they didn't have Gatorade. They had salt tablets. And, they, and so you took a glass, a little cup of that water, and it's salty water. But you drank it because you was thirsty. But you're sweating the salt out really fast. And so you drink everything they'll let you drink. And they said, line up! 40-yard sprints. Oh, 40 yards not bad. I done run a mile. But uh-oh, he said sprint. He didn't say jog. He didn't say marathon. Sprint. And after 10 of those... We go to 50 yards, and then we're back to 40. And then we do this fun little drill where you run out 10 yards, bend down, touch the line, and run back, and you do 10 of those. And then now you're ready, your tongue, you didn't realize your tongue was two feet long. <laughs> and then says, okay, now you're warmed up. Now we're going to get down to business. 200 jumping jacks. Ready, begin. Oh, my. 20 push-ups. Hit it. In unison. Oh. I'm saying, okay, Jesus, come and get me now. And then something that I'm, I know the devil invented. They're called leg lifts. You lay on your back and you lock your fingers behind your head. And you keep your legs straight and you bring your heels six inches off the ground and hold it. You didn't realize your feet weighed 4,000 pounds. And then he would say, spread them. And then you'd have to spread your legs as far as you could. But you had to keep your heels six inches off the ground. And then together, out, together, out. And you did that for what you thought was four years. But it was, you know, how long does it take you to do 25 of those? But you got to stop when he says stop. And then you go. And then he says, let them down. Is like timber falling. <laughs> what was he doing? Was that coach trying to kill us? We really thought he was. What was he doing? I mean, I wanted to play. I wanted to hit somebody. I wanted, you know, I wanted. I wanted to have shoulder pads and and thigh pads and. And 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 uh, hip pads and and I wanted to, I wanted to chase somebody down and I wanted I, I wanted to find that little fella with the ball and just uh, that's what I wanted to do. You see, I want the pads. No, you're not ready for the pads. You got to go through these trials. What are these trials for? They strengthen you. You know, they said, well, I've got to get you in shape, our farm boy. Listen, I knew about sp splitting locust post. I knew, I, I, knew, I, knew, I knew about throwing 70-pound bales up on the trailer, up on high. I knew all that stuff. Uh, you know? You know, I, some of them city boys wasn't too, well, never mind. But it was, it was, he was, it, they were trials. They were tests. They were, they were getting us ready for when we did put the pads on. And then we got to scrimmage each other. And then they have drills for that. 
we had to do all those sprints and all those exercises with our pads on. Oh, my goodness. And then I thought, thank God he didn't give us the pads on day one. There would have been dead people out there. But I had, we, had, we went through the testing, the trials. We were pushed to the limit. We were drinking salt water that tasted good. <laughs> and then the first game. And oh boy, and you're looking down there, and you and you seeing, you know, you know if 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 we were kicking off, you you know you had a plan, and everybody had their coverage, and and all these things, and and he always had me out there on the end. And boy, we we kick off, and we're zooming down. We all had our assignments, you know, and after you get past a certain place, then you, you know, if the ball wasn't in front of you, you start looking for the ball. That's what all those sprints were for. That's what that mile run was for. That's what all those practices were for. All the scrimmaging against your teammates Learning your assignments and learning how to do this, that, and the other. Learning, learning what the end did and the, and the guard and the tackle and the center was supposed to do and, and what the quarterback was doing and the running back and, and the fullback. The, the half, back then they called them halfback and fullback. You know, and, and if we had a wingman or a wide out or if you had two halfbacks and a fullback, you know, depending. Everybody's learning their, their assignment. Why? Because he puts you through the trials so when the real game came, you were ready to go. That is what trials are for. You say, my job's no fun. Pass the test. Pass the test. Oh, my goodness. My school... I mean, I got a report last night where a, I don't know, a second grader in one of our, our schools right here in this county went to the lunchroom and she, bow and she got her food and she bowed her head, never said one word audibly. And she prayed over her food. And then she's getting ready to eat. Started eating. And one of the people that worked there come up to her and said, what were you doing? She said, oh, I'm not, I wasn't doing nothing. I'm just sitting here eating. No, before you started eating, what were you doing? She said, well, I was praying and Thanking the Lord for my food. She said, we don't pray in public school. Right here in this county. I want to know who that teacher is. I want to know. I'm going to find her name. I'm going to search this out. And then, or this worker, this, this schoolroom worker. And then, and then gets back to the class and then the teacher says, we don't do that. Well, I got, I, I got something else to tell you. Our Supreme Court has already ruled that you cannot prohibit student-initiated prayer, even in the public schools. And we cannot. Now, you know, the devil says, be a coward. Just get in the corner and don't be political. This is not political. This is not political. Just because the devil has made moral issues political, that's his problem. Truth has to speak to power. We do. We do. And if you're a taxpayer, you've got a right to ask questions. You understand? And God bless that little girl. She says, no, I pray. 
No, you don't pray. Oh, yes, I do. God bless her. Amen? God bless her. I mean, this country is in such sad shapes because preachers, especially, and Christians in general, and churches have failed their job. And we've become so stinking politically correct that we are of no effect. And I'm telling you, God wants us to make, make a mark. Amen? Well, here's another trial. <laughs> I didn't go looking for it. It come and found me. Amen? So, and, and really... And you got to go in love. But now, right is right and wrong is wrong. And I don't care who says, I don't care who says wrong is right. I don't care how nice they are, how much you like them, how pretty they are to look at. Wrong is still wrong. Amen? So, put on the helmet. Put on the shoulder pads. Put on the... All that other stuff. Put on the cleats. You know, put on all them other pads, those arm pads, those, those, all them things. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Where's the devil carrying that ball? And it's joy. Amen? Let's stand to our feet.